and also to support each other in uh, professional queries or professional activities that we undertake during the processes or in general also when we uh, want to have more uh, clarity on certain issues pertaining to IDC. So today's uh, program uh, is about seeking views uh, of the participants on the two uh, discussion papers which IDBI has proposed. One is on uh, strengthening uh, regulatory framework of liquidation processes and the other is on uh, the three specific issues which have been identified by IDBI for corporate insolvency process. Uh, I would request all participants, uh, whoever wants to uh, uh, present their views, to uh, uh, raise their hand whenever uh, Manish ji is asking them to raise their hands or seeking views. Uh, Mr. Manish Paniwal, advocate, uh, he's an advocate and IP also, so he'll be moderating the session today. And uh, all the views which we received today would be collated and uh, sent to IDBI as a document uh, in response to these two discussion papers. So, requesting Manish ji uh, take over and start the uh, process. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. The we are today in a very important process which a democratic country should enshrine, which is the participation of the stakeholders in framing of the law. So discussion paper essentially is opinion to the law making authorities that what should be the law. So we have to take this in the spirit of being a responsible citizen and stakeholders in the insolvency process to give what the should be. So later on, we should not get bombarded with the regulations which are totally unreasonable and or illegal or it is going to be challenged before the court. So there are two discussion papers which IBBI has floated. The first is regarding the framework of the liquidation process. And the second one is on the CIRP process. I will start with the CIRP process and the mechanism, like the method I'm adopting is the first I will give the, what is the thinking of the IBBI and how they, how they put forth a proposition. So what is happening in both this discussion paper is that RBI, the IBBI is coming out with an argument that these are the situation, these are the existing prevailing law in the similar or other jurisdiction, and this is how we propose to amend. And thereafter, they are seeking specific suggestion on the few points. So first, I will summarize what was the reasons IBBI felt it compelling to come out with such a regulations. Then what is going in the mind, and then on each point, I will invite all of you to give your suggestions so we can record it and forward it to the IBBI. So one of the one of the strength of sending an individual suggestion and as a group is that always the in a democracy the number matters. The higher the number, the it matters more. That's so how with the democracy function. So I will share the discussion paper on the screen and thereafter I, we will go one by one through these uh, issues. So first I am sharing the discussion paper on the CIRP. <clears throat> uh, I'm sure uh, you must be able to see it now. Uh, anybody can confirm? Is it visible? Yes, yes visible. It's visible not from the beginning, maybe. Uh, okay. Like that, that, from the beginning? Yes, it will, it will go on the beginning. So that's where I was reading it. Uh, just a second. Yeah. Yes. So, just a second, give me a second to adjust my screen. Okay. So the first discussion paper, both the discussion paper came on the twenty seventh. The first discussion paper deals with three broad issues. The first is code of conduct for committee of the creditors, which has been much highlighted. But there are two other aspects which have so much not highlighted in the media is restriction on the request of the resolution plan and use of Swiss challenge. And thirdly, treatment of the live bank guarantees and line of credit in the CIRP. So you know, the, it was a need was felt by the IBBI after going through the various cases 
that the role of the COC should be regulated, like how they should perform their functions and why the need was felt, they came out with the certain examples. So first they start with an example in the case of the Andhra Bank, in Andhra Bank versus Sterling Biotech. In this case, what was happened that section 29A of the section 29A, the promoters were accepted to take over the company in the guise of one-time settlement. So IBBI thought that this is this exercise has not been conducted properly and the COC has exercised its uh, discretion improperly. The next case they came across or the argument they put forward is the Bank of Baroda case in the Sishir Kumar. They felt that the COC on the ground of the resolution plan that it was again the same thing. The promoters tried to gain control of the entire the promoter gained control of the entire CD. Uh, the, he, the person who was responsible for the insolvency of the CD himself took over the control. Third instance, the site, which is the must, uh, which is a case in which Bhushan power. In this case, what has happened that the legal expenses incurred by the COC was built into the CIRP cost. The, the amount was staggering, it's 12 crore of rupees and it was spent by the COC and it was taken as a CIR because perhaps this matter is still pending before the Delhi High Court and it was under the challenge. I don't know the outcome, but it was under the challenge. The next is the Varsha Spark Limited. In this case, the FC, the financial creditor recovered the debt during the moratorium. So, the IBBI felt that this kinds of the behavior on the part of the COC is not acceptable. Then they have cited another case, Gitanjali Jams. So in this case, a strange thing has happened that COC with a tacit understanding with the IP that I am going to appoint you and you choose somebody else to do your work. So what has happened, decided to engage the entity service. So there was a tacit understanding between the FC and the entity, your services will be taken and the IP was forced to hire the services or kind of given into the demand of the COC that only this entity will provide the services. In Sashidhar's case, there was a, another delaying tactics was adopted by the members of COC and they do not like their tactics was such that the IBBI felt that they are not in consonance with the objective of the IBC. Then it, in multiple cases, just like the general Saxena, so there was a practice adopted by the COC members to send those people in the COC who was not in, empowered to take decision then and there. So every decision was deferred of some kind that they will make a decision only after the seniors give them the instruction. So this was in a multiple cases, it was held that this practice is not good. Then another thing which has happened over the period of time that the IBBI observed that the power of the IP has been exercised by the COC in improper manner. So what is this? Sorry happened? to uh, interrupt, your screen is not moving. We would like to... Uh... Scroll up or scroll down this page. Thank you. Just a second, sir. Uh, I'll, I'll, just a second. I'll do it again, sir. Uh, is it moving, sir? Yeah, it's moving now. No, Thank you. Thank you. So in another case, which is like uh, Rajesh Jain case, in which what has happened that it is the duty of the resolution professional to decide whether a particular creditor is a financial creditor or operational creditor. But this decision was instead of the RP was taken by the COC and this was felt by the IBBI as an improper exercise of the power by the COC. So then in the case of STCI, the proposed the ui or form g continuously was reissued 10 times without approving without getting approval from the adjudicating authority so multiple instances have been cited 
in which it happened so that the coc did not exercise the power in a consonance with the spirit of the ibc and therefore a need was felt to to have some kind of guideline for coc to exercise the power and this need was not only felt by the ibbi but the standing committee committee which was constituted to look into the functioning of the ibbi so in para 8 it has been highlighted that there is an urgent need there is an urgent need to have a professional code of conduct for the coc which will define the circumscribe their decision as these larger implication for the so basically what it means to say that there has to be some kind of rules and regulations which make the coc accountable to all the stakeholders because they are not only deciding on their own behalf but they are deciding on the behalf of the other creditors and there is a very classic statement in this thing that the responsibility comes with the accountability and as of today the ibc stands today the coc has lots of responsibility without an account accountability which is being misused by uh, in many of the companies in the cds in the four mentioned manner so they go through the the international thereafter they look into the international experiences uk then economic analysis and at the same time what they have found is that there is some mechanism in other countries where coc have been made accountable to so what they have done they have asked the public comments on three issues the first is whether a code of conduct should be specified by the board or it perhaps the question would be that whether the, apart from the board anybody can exercise or whatever it is secondly they give a long list of items in the annexure on which the everybody is supposed to give their opinion on and there is a long list like a to z and then again a b c d e so we will go one by one and solicit the suggestions of the members so the first i will directly go to the annexure the annexure is here so <clears throat> yeah so the annexure starts in the page number 14 and here they give the suggestions so first few is the general and the next few are the specific guidelines which ibbi proposed to formulate to guide the functioning of the coc so if we go through the first few ones whether it should be there or not like there are multiple thing the first is maintain integrity in performing its roles and functions under the code the b must not misrepresent any facts or the situation should refrain from being involved in any action that is detrimental to the objective of the code must maintain objectivity in access uh, must maintain the objectivity in exercising the decision must disclose the details of any conflict of interest not required to directly indirectly to permit any relative of the committee of the members to do so then cooperate with the insolvency professional not influence uh, the decision of the work of the committee as to make undue gain or undue advantage and not to influence the decision of the working committee disclose the so till a to h are the general general thing like you will do everything so any suggestion on the behalf of the members out of these uh, things uh, yes sir so so i think uh, i'll stop the share and then i'll reshare once the suggestions are there so uh, mr madhusudan ji please please give your comments sir okay thank you manish for starting it so well and uh, i would like to thank ibbi for coming out with at least a discussion paper to bridle this committee of creditors of course better than never but it has been delayed so much and it has resulted into a lot of unethical practices among the ips between the coc members and ips because the key issue is uh, appointment of a insolvency professional and if you if you see the market and how the things are going on 
that was another reason that IBBI came up with the discussion paper and uh, regulation to restrict the number of assignments with a particular insolvency professional. So it is better to regulate the conduct of COC, but where is the power with IBBI to regulate that? And what happens if they don't behave in the manner as required under the code of conduct? Like IP is a service provider, so IBBI has all the tools of inspection, investigation, disciplinary committee, and then uh, penalizing or filing a case under section 236. But what will happen in case of if the COC doesn't uh, go by the code of conduct, which is being proposed? And where is the power with the IBBI to regulate the conduct of COC? If there is no such provision in the code. And most of the things, because when we try to frame the rules, we try to make it all adjustive, like the code of conduct for the insolvency professionals. And this is similar to that. So my only question is whether IBBI will be able to enforce it, what will the tools available with it, and whether the rot which has been created because of the non-transparency in the appointment process and fixation of the fee, whether it will be controlled or not. And I leave to other members to give their opinion on this issue. Uh, well, you are referring to the implementation part, uh, you are saying the rules can be made, but how to implement that? Is that the idea? Yes, sir. The, I think the two central idea is one, where is the carrot to stick approach? Like if you don't follow, what are the implications? And secondly, whether the IBBI, which is proposing to regulate, actually has the power or not. So that those are the two issues. Now I invite Mr. Rajkamal ji to give his opinion on the issue. Further to the uh, observation by Madhusudan ji, uh, I've got, uh, I, I fully agree that uh, at the moment, the present uh, law structure, IBC code or regulation, the, the IBBI doesn't have the power. So first, the thing is the, how this code can be effective, that needs to be, that needs to be put in place. I have, I have, I have uh, suggestions in this regard. There are two alternates. Firstly, that since the IBC code uh, supersedes the other other laws, so the uh, control the making the uh, make, uh, regulation regulating the COC by IBBI, there there needs to be a change in the IBC code itself, which seems to be a distinct thinking because uh, government is not going to uh, have the two regulations on on the COC because the COC is at the moment is primarily. Um, of the bankers and financial institutions which are being regulated by the RBI. And RBI is the right uh, regulator for as far as the COC is concerned. So uh, my thinking is ki whatever the code of conduct the uh, IBI, IBI wants to bring in, if it is brought in with the concurrence and with the parallel regulation by the RBI, until unless that is that happens, that any code of conduct introduced by the uh, uh, IBBI may not have that effective as because since uh, as Mr. Madhusudan is told that uh, IBBI doesn't have the uh, power to regulate the COC. This is my submission. Now the thing is in this this aspect, the only the banking uh, banking uh, area will be will be covered. What about the individual uh, financial creators and all the, how they, they are going to be uh, they are going to be regulated in that case because uh, since the uh, main main problem of the COC is coming with the banking se se sector only, I think so that uh, with, with the interference of the RBI it can be done. And as far as the other individual um, uh, creators are concerned, they uh, IBBI IBBI can regulate if the uh, if the RBI also uh, give gives the such, such such type of guidelines in that case. This is my submission, and that way only this can be done. Yeah, thank you. thank you very much, Raj Kamalji. Uh, now I invite Mr. Devang Sampaji to give his views. I would just like to add a point that COC is a body which is totally different from financial creditors. 
So COC itself should be regulated by the same body which regulates IP, which is IBBI. Similarly, in liquidation, uh, also if the stakeholders consultation committee is having decision making powers, there should be a code of conduct for them and also regulated by IBBI. And again, maybe the changing of RP, which is uh, an issue Madhusudan has rightly pointed out, which is used as a tool, uh, maybe backend to carry out the work uh, uh, desired by uh, some of the COC members. Similarly, liquidation, the same tool is being introduced. So without a proper regulation and a regulatory body, the same body which regulates uh, IP, which is IBBI. I believe uh, there would be different two separate regulatory bodies, again would create an issue. So the same body and similar code of conduct should be applicable to all, that is my humble submission. Thank you very much, Devangji. This was a quite useful suggestion that not only the financial creditors and COC, but also the stakeholder committees duly constituted should be regulated because even they are taking decisions on the behalf of the others. So that's a very valid suggestion. And uh, now we will move to the individual points where the IBBI is pretty much specific that what they expect. So I'll again... Uh -huh. we'll Sir, our small suggestion be beyond this also. Mm -hmm. uh, even the disclosures and uh, maybe some regulatory forms, not as much as IP, but there should be some measures which should be also be introduced for COC members and stakeholders to be submitted. So that even they come prepared to the meeting and even they know they'll be taken to task by the regulator. Yes, sir. That is a valid suggestion, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Devang. Thank you very much, Devang, sir. Now the next suggestion of the IBBI like, uh, is that disclose the existence of the pecuniary or personal relationship with any stakeholders or entity to the distribution as soon as it becomes aware of it. So there is a disclosure requirement like one have the arbitrator or a judge, they should also disclose their interest. Next is ensure that the decision maker Decisions are made without any bias, favor, fear, coercion, undue influence or conflict of interest. The word conflict of interest is very wide and they are asking the COC members to disclose that conflict of interest. Perhaps the IBBI wants to avoid a situation wherein the, the, the undue influences are being created to hire a particular service provider and etc. Then the third is maintain the transparency in all activities and the decision making. So I'm inviting suggestions. I'm clubbing these things together because it's like a long list. So I, I wish that we will complete everything in all the things. So now I solicit the suggestions from the members. And I, I wish to indicate one more thing. The wider the participation, the better it is. And I can see many eminent faces and IPs in the August gathering like the Ganshamji and uh, uh, many other IPs who have uh, disclosed. Uh, Mr. So please, please go ahead and give your suggestions. Mr. Evil is also there, Mr. Atul Grover. Anyone who would like to speak uh, may be better if they give their opinion. Yeah, hi, am I audible? Oh, yes, you are audible, sir. Avilji. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. So in terms of uh, the code of conduct, I'm not sure whether uh, I think IBBI can make it, but whether these uh, can be enforced is a different question as far as stakeholders, especially the committee of creditors is concerned because uh, this probably might be also over-regulation for them because these itself are regulated entities. However, if you ask me, a code of conduct is necessary uh, like an RP has to file a form H uh, after the end of CIRP. I think some disclosure at the COC level should also come in terms of uh, certain key uh, resolution items uh, and how the COC has looked at it. For example, internal finance. Uh, most of the resolution professionals are facing an issue even in multiple meetings, right from the first COC meeting, the RP puts up the resolution for interim finance even after three or four meetings it is not put to vote, or even if it is put to vote, uh, it is basically rejected. Secondly, would be related party transactions, uh, like salary to directors, so on and so forth. 
So I think some of these key aspects in terms of uh, they can probably look at amending the CIRP regulations. And after every CIRP gets concluded, probably the lead COC member uh, or this, uh, the COC members would be given uh, the responsibility of filing a compliance certificate in that aspect. Uh, the time taken for voting, so so on and so forth. I think as far as uh, the other issues which are there, uh, disclosure of, I think uh, that eventually would get taken care of because these are institutions now. But I think from a timeline perspective is what uh, most of the RPs face issues. And if that gets addressed somewhere by way of a code of conduct or even in terms of uh, uh, filings, I think that is something which would help uh, the resolution committee to a large extent in conducting the CIR in a time-bound manner. Thank you very much, Ahilji. Now I invite Mr. Kulkit Devaraji to give his views. Uh, are you there, sir, Polkiji? I think uh, any other members can wish to give his suggestions on this particular aspect. Am I audible? This is Atul Grover here. Yes, Atul ji. I said, uh, the key code of conduct, so it's uh, absolutely critical. There is, there are no two thoughts about it. Whether IBBI has the authority to create one, et cetera, it's only you know, a matter of uh, getting around uh, this issue, which is not a, not a big thing. One can always assume that COC is different from FC and therefore uh, you know, it falls within the purview. Otherwise, uh, there are, there'll be ways and, ways and means to ensure that IBBI does have the authority eventually. I don't see that as a big issue. Of course, what happens if it is not followed? The uh, you know uh, because IPs are now going to be facing uh, huge penalties, and in the form, uh, if wherever they will um, you know will not be able to meet a timeline or whatever issue that they know that they feel ke hamare penalty padegi, so the IP will definitely say the COC member did not do this or X Y Z, and a little bit of blame game will begin. Uh, because, uh, you know, for the sake of transparency, one, if, if a COC member is not voting and not taking a decision, what is an IP supposed to do? Obviously, he will complain, he will give it to it in writing now specifically, because uh, his, um, you know, he's, he's on the, uh, on the, on the chopping board. So, um, I, if it is not followed, um, I don't know, but uh, maybe I, we, we must ask IBBI to have uh, the penalty shared with the COC member or some kind of uh, this thing so that they are also caught and it, it cannot be IP who has to um, face the music for the reasons uh, of uh, COC members. And uh, going into details, just say appointment, uh, you know, registered valuers, other professionals, one is asking for appointment, it's not taking place, the COC is not doing it, or uh, payments are not coming through, uh, disclosures, naturally, uh, disclosure, so definitely just like us. So uh, the way I see gradually, uh, although COC is, is more critical to the process than even IP, because ultimately IP is the face, but it's really the COC, which is the engine. And uh, uh, they should definitely, uh, in whatever manner, uh, you know, face, um, be equally responsible as an IP. And uh, naturally, uh, the banks are uh, having their own panels and they have their own uh, IPs uh, who are their favorites and certain IPEs. And they, you know, people have figured a way out to, to milk the system. And uh, that is why our uh, costs have gone up and delays have come in. And we see all these things, um, haircuts being so high and uh, weird decisions being taken. But see, if we don't control these things, uh, the entire IBC code is in jeopardy. And um, so I think it's equally important. And I think gradually it will become, uh, I do not know how, whether it comes through IBA or RBI or uh, IBBI all of us, or some other body which comes uh, across. but. Um, to me, it is just as critical as uh, you know what an IP faces, and the penalties should be as high. 
So that's that's my take so far. Thank you, Atulji, for those valuable suggestions. And some of them has been covered in the, these guidelines, but the devil lies in the details. So mm -hmm. when you see each guideline in a particular manner, how it has been worded may have type of implications which are intended or unintended. On this note, I invite Mr. Shiv Nandan Sharma ji to give his views. Um, I have recently attended an event on this issue about two, three days back. And some of my friends would have attended that event already, where I brought out one very unique matter which got listed before one of the benches in Delhi that the COC decided within less than five months to liquidate a company. It's a real estate company. And they said that we have already attempted ourselves to recover the amounts and all that. And let us go for liquidation. There is no need to publish form G even. RP has three, four times approached the COC for form G. And COC said, sorry, a lot of cost involved, many things involved. We'll appoint you as liquidator. Let's go for liquidation. And I mean, it's one unique case and where the apparently the asset value is more than 100 crores. And the tribunal has even named one or two ARCs where they say that solution does not come and these ARCs are probably hand and glove with promoters or some other parties. So my view was that whatever guidelines come, whatever things come, recently our honorable regulator introduced a form CIRP 8 when the issue was raised that forensic transaction audit applications under 43, 45 and 66 are yielding no money. So they suddenly came up with CIRP 8. They said, let us at least know that what is happening. Maybe the regulator is not in control, but let us know. My suggestion would be that whatever regulation comes with regard to COC, I've already suggested in that meeting that the COC be advised by IBBI as well as the banking regulator to start filing forms as IPs, IRPs, and all valuers, we are filing so many forms. Why not the COC members, the day they file an application for under Section 7 or whatever, let the forms be submitted to regulator with copy to RBI. So whatever regulations you make, let there be a clarity that RP suggested this, we did not do this, and let the regulator, uh, bankruptcy regulator, introduce or our IIPIs uh, introduce some forms where an RP is made to inform that I approach COC for forensic, I approach for appointing security, I appoint, approach for this, and COC did not take a call. None of our reporting forms talks of this that we diplomatically report that COC did not permit me to function. COC may have his own difficulties. I am today trying to find, and there are a few cases where I've come that even interim finance is not available. COC is insisting and RP is working without any interim finance. And there are apparently few cases and I am trying to approach in one of my cases to COC that you give me interim finance, otherwise I'm going to the uh, AA and requesting that let the COC be instructed. So my view is that let there be highlights, red, yellow, orange flags that this thing could not happen in COC. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your valuable suggestion. And it is really important that why the COC should not comply because the entire preference has been COC because the legislature thought that they are the custodian for the stakes of the entire nation having the public money. So on that note, I invite Mr. E. Singh Parihar to give his views as he has uh, given in the chat box, but Hearing him in person would be a good thing. So, Mr. Singh, please go ahead. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think the most important thing uh, which must be considered uh, are regulated by IBVI 
<coughs> is the appointment of RP and change of RP. It must be regulated by AA. Uh, COC has a upper hand regarding appointment of uh, RP or change of RP and they negotiate all their terms under this issue. So I, uh, I think this is the far most important and uh, all other things are like uh, fees and expenses and other issues which are put up to COC for approval. If it is not considered within a timeline, uh, uh, say three days, uh, it may be a uh, genuine time, then it, sh it should be uh, taken as deemed sanction. Otherwise, if uh, they are denying, they must uh, explain with reason. These are few important things which may uh, change the uh, rules of the game. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Dr. Singh has highlighted very important issue that how the RP can perform independently when he himself is subjected to control by the COC. So on that note, I think uh, I again invite Mr. Atul Grovarji who has raised his hand to give his views. Yeah, just a thought that came to my mind while the discussion was on that all the forms that we have to fill now should have another separate column. It should not be in the description box where you write, uh, you know, a few lines and you read, not read, but it's a separate checkbox which says that something did not happen because of COC and whatever reason. The moment that checkbox is hit and submitted, uh, you know, it's very easy to automate an email which goes to the, all the COC members saying that the RP is has uh, not been able to do, you know, a particular job please report as to why, what is the issue? So what is gonna happen is that in, when the COC will also know that if uh, IP has uh, checkbox tick, then we have to give an answer. So, you know, it's like a balancing act. Right now, uh, IPs are subservient to the COC because the COC controls everything. The COC knows nothing is gonna to happen to them. Now the IP is under threat of uh, legal act, uh, penalties and other action. He has no option but to, you know, come out with the truth, no matter what it is. And he has to write, give it in writing, that COC ne kuch nahi kiya. Or COC ne nahi kiya, to usi samay COC ko bula ke unko email jaye, unko bolo ji, reply within 24 hours, jaise hume hota hai, raat ko email aati hai, subha tak hume jawab do. So that uh, if, uh, if, if nothing else, just like we say, na, uh, what IBC has done is that there's a change of mindset for the creditors, for the lenders. So likewise, we need uh, something similar, which says change of mindset for the COC. So it is so much a threat. The IBC threat is there that everybody starts behaving correctly. So all our forms must have that extra checkbox and uh, which should result in COC being called upon for explanation. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. That's an important and very pertinent and uh, detailed suggestion. What happens is that the what is the need of the suggestion is that most of these guidelines are very general so if we can come out with some suggestions which are to the point that will really help the ibbi and entire fraternity now i invite mr madhusudan ji again to give his views uh, please unmute sir uh, i missed one more point and uh, maybe it is partly in response to what atulji said see Putting a code of conduct for COC is like taming a tiger, which has been responsible for mountains of the NPA. And every time they invented new things like ARC, clean the balance sheet, and then they start again creating NPAs. So it's a deep rot in the system. And I doubt if with the simple uh, code of conduct for COCs will uh, improve that. I just wanted to highlight a couple of decisions of the Supreme Court with reference to the powers or uh, the freedom or supremacy of the Committee of Creditors. We often talk about the commercial decisions of the COCs having a supremacy, and it has been upheld in number of judgments, even allowing the resolution plan to be lower than the liquidation value. So I just wanted to point out the change in the tone and the observations of the uh, Supreme Court even. In the Swiss ribbon case, when this was challenged, they made a categoric statement that since NCLEP is looking into it, whether the uh, resolution plan is fair to all this uh, 
operational creditors or financial creditors or not, and they are amending it. But when it came to uh, cases either case and then SR Steel, it was a complete reversal. They said nothing doing. Whatever the COC has done is final. Of course, they had uh, put riders in terms of their uh, responsibility as a public office and all those kind of things. So all this has to be viewed in uh, light of the judgments of the Supreme Court, which are coming and uh, empowering the COC more and more. So whether this kind of uh, code of conduct can replace the judgments of uh, Supreme Court or can overpower that, that's another question. Thank you very much, Madhusudan ji. Uh, any other member, or I, I can see many young members who has participated in the, the their participation will bring valuable suggestions. So, uh, I'll, I'll go to next few suggestions by the IBBI, again reshare the same document, so we can discuss the next few suggestions. So the next thing they say is that maintain transparency in the all activities of the decision making. So the transparency is now on the shoulder of the COC, how it is going to be done, God knows, the IBBI is not clear about it. Secondly, they say that shall not adjust the receipts of the CD during the CIRP process. This has happened in the multiple cases. Hope, hopefully the situation will improve. Now the most important thing, become fully aware of the provisions of the IBC. So they are asking the bankers to do a lot of reading, like they have to come prepared with the entire book of the IBC and it is fair for them to read it and then put forward what they want and what they want. Nominate representative with sufficient authorization. So this has been stressed by the NCLT multiple times. Then participate actively and constructively and effectively in deliberates and decision making. So it's not unusual to see that a lot of bankers sitting in their office, having attending the multiple COCs, just they, they start the Zoom meeting and then do nothing. And at the end, they say that I will come tomorrow to give my voting. So what is going to happen to those cases? Is there any specific guidelines? Active participation brings out concrete suggestion. This is true for the COC as well as for this meeting. So I, I ask all my friends to give their valuable suggestions and uh, I'll cover a few more points in this uh, next go. Uh, not to conceal any material information. So most of the bankers are giving only the books like uh, the, the bankers books and et cetera, but they're not giving the actual loan transactions. So what happened in the valuation report, whether those documents should be Fourth will be given to the IP as well as as soon as he is appointed. Then ensure the timelines provided in the code and regulations are not breached. This is one of the suggestions given by our members as well. But how it is going to be done? This is also to be kept in the very well pertinent suggestion came from one of the members that in fact the mail should go to them. Then the, the next tricky thing which is coming in which I am not sure whether how it will work that the facilitate the appointment of various professionals within the timeline prescribed under the code and the regulations. So I invite the suggestion of this August gathering on all those issues. Uh, so any suggestions on all those issues uh, which, uh, which was highlighted by the IBBI. So it's not necessary that anybody agrees, but it's important that they disagree and give suggestions. Uh, hello. Hello. Yes, Ganshan ji, please go ahead. Uh, Paliwal ji, the code of conduct will just give a direction. It cannot fix the accountability until unless it comes into the shape of a regulation. One thing. Secondly, once my learning colleague was saying that mail should go to the bankers or FCs, once the mail is going to, you can say bankers, the next meeting the RP may not be seeing. Once mail is going, they will be moving, having the voting right to go for another RP at the 11th hour. So it is very difficult to face a practical situation. So what is, because there was nothing, now something is coming out. This is better and we should wait and keep on doing something and something. It will reach some stage one day. We cannot expect immediately after our meeting or suggestion, everything will happen, no. <laughs> so let us start doing something. 
uh, if you want real change in the system, bring the COC member at par with RP. All condition and regulation where which the R, uh, RPs are following, the COC member should also at par with the RP. Then only the things will be balanced. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. A uh, very important point is highlighted by Ganshamji that the first step is the most important fact. Now on this point, I again invite Mr. Atulji to give his opinion. I Ganshamji ke saath bilkul sehmat hoon. Actual mein kya hai ki if we look at from a higher uh, you know uh, perspective, IP was made to stand in a corner and everybody else was looking at him and he was supposed to juggle all the CD, the FCs and whatever. And he was the only person, you know, in the in the corner of the room. Ke ji, aap dekho. Now with this, what is going to happen is that uh, uh, whatever IP is responsible, so IP and and COC are now one body. They can't work at uh, loggerheads with each other. Whatever is IP responsible for, so is COC back to back. That is exactly what Ganchamji has also said. And they have to be jointly responsible for, for the outcomes. And what is going to happen is that we are going to have COC now having other IPs or maybe either they themselves have to raise up to the level of knowledge as, as the IP or maybe they will have to appoint other IPs to on their behalf so we definitely need a balancing act here. The CD, the COC, the IP, they all have to work together and be jointly responsible. Therefore, everything in the form, everything in the penalties eventually have to uh, come together and uh, make sure that, you know, all the decision makers are equally responsible. Same thing what Ganjamji said, more or less. Thank you. Thank you, Atul. The responsibility has to be shared by all, not just by one person who is an IP. Now I invite Mr. Ganesh Remani ji for giving his suggestions. Uh, hi, uh, rather instantly I'm coming from another uh, department of industries where uh, uh, they have a claim and I'm seeking certain subsidies which were allowed for the corporate earlier to be continued in liquidation as part of the circular that they also have it in hand. What I understood is whether it is COC, whether it is any creator like departments or whether it is individual who suffered, they will not cooperate. No matter what. So how much we will go after code of conduct? If the, only, the way I look at this is forget code of conduct, deemed timelines. As someone says that if COC is supposed to respond in three days, if they don't respond in three days, by default, it's a deemed acceptance. Shift the goalpost so automatically, whoever has to come in, because there are so many varieties of committee of credit. There are individuals who could have learned to what extent one would start saying that he, this particular code will start driving every person. And they have their own internal code of conduct. Like bankers have their own code of conduct. How far we'll reach on this code of conduct. So I think if someone wants seriously on timelines, just say everything is deemed timelines. So it's a natural reaction that others will start following the rules and do the needful, whether it's an appointment, whether it's an approval, whatever it may be. This is my view. Thank you very much, sir. This is an important aspect that the concept of deemed approval should come into the picture. So it will force the people to participate and give their suggestions. Now I invite Mr. Vishalji to give his valuable opinion. Thank you, Maniji. Maniji, whatever ecosystem we are discussing under IBC, this ecosystem will work certainly when timeline will be adhered. And for adhering the timeline, making accountable only to RP will not serve the purpose. Whomsoever the stakeholder in, the, in this ecosystem, all, are, all should be, get, uh, should be uh, fastened with some responsibility and accountability. And accountability is the underlying uh, thing which is to be governed by the IBUI because this ecosystem, whole ecosystem is being governed by IBUI now. 
this is the uh, this code of conduct may be a first stepping stone towards this direction and uh, but at the same time the whomsoever uh, whether is the adjudicating authority whether it is the coc whether it is a member of the uh, uh, promoter group whether it is a uh, other stakeholder uh, participating professionals everyone they should be uh, held accountable for their acts and omission and uh, reactions and uh, for their non compliance for that purpose this code of conduct should should uh, embedded some uh, this uh, mr atul and someone has given this suggestion that form form there there should be a check box in form may should go to the uh, respective stakeholders not only the coc all stakeholders who are involved in the system should get that uh, accountability that is my view on that thank you vishal ji for your valuable suggestion uh, i think mr ganesh ramani ji wants to come back and say something about it i've already spoken i'm sorry i don't know i've already i've already spoken manish okay so i think your hair hair hand is raised so i asked you oh, okay i don't know how to remove it okay i'll do that next time. thank you okay sometimes it so happens so now i come back again to the the suggestions so uh the next few suggestions echoed like what 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 was suggested by the members so ibbi perhaps had some intuition that what is the problem and they said something like this in the following things so i'll i'll now say next few suggestions of the ibbi the coc must co coc should cooperate with the insolvency professional in seeking various approvals from the adjudicating authority within model timelines prescribed under the code of the regulations next ensure complete confidentiality of the information so this is something the members has to see that at one point of time they are saying that there should be uh, uh, it should be transparent and fair on the other in the same regulation they are saying it is confidentiality so the issue is whether the confidentiality breeds corruption or the confidentiality gives something more than like a creative value or something else so ensure complete confidentiality of information that they receive or come across a part of the process of the time secondly at all times respect the privacy of any information take necessary measures to ensure insolvency resolution process cost is reasonable keeping in the balance the need to conduct a smooth and timely resolution process so what should be the cost is also falling back on the coc it's giving them the legitimate right or saying the conferring a legitimacy they can decide what is the cost ensure their cost associated with the process is not booked in the insolvency resolution process cost not withheld release of the insolvency resolution process cost including fee of the professional so this is one of the important concern pointed out by many of the members so this is also taken care adhere to the code of the regulations in performing their roles and functions under the code at all time bear the collective interest of all the stakeholders in mind in all activities and the decision making so what the ibbi perhaps wants here to say that you can't ignore the operational creditors and others and so i solicit like uh, the views of the members on these issues so uh, like <clears throat> there are lots of lots of members i think there are good participation 58 people there has to be more people to speak on every issue ali wal ji one point one point yes kanshyam ji the rp is the chairman of the coc yes sir so so he should be given all the powers to handle the coc have you seen any body where chairman is guided by other persons or he is following the orders of other persons yeah that's an important suggestions but this is the model the and, and, and when company is a ongoing concern when it was not under you can say insolvency he is the chairman the private you can say director was handling and doing everything rp is also equivalent to that in all respect as per the regulation and act so why rp cannot be empowered to handle the coc i think there is like it's not uh, yes yes please 
<laughs> my my take is that the people do not have the confidence. Therefore, the other regulation came which regulates the role of the RP. We will come to that shortly. So so far. Manish ji, yes, Manish, Manish ji. I think RP is more like a CEO, not a chairman, and the COC is more like a board. So RP reports to the board. It's yes, not sir. other way around. RP reports to the board. So yes, therefore, sir. COC does have powers. Yes, sir. This is a dual structure concept when one is the board and one is the stakeholder. So that's that's an important point. And now we are coming to the last leg of these suggestions. So I will again share the screen because there is a long list A to Z and then again A to E. So there are lots of suggestions which has given by the IBI. It's 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 important that the members, if they are not able to give the suggestions right now orally, they can mail us or message us and we will take in like we will incorporate all those suggestions whether it is for or against what one we will submit to the IBBI. So with that note, I'll again share the last few uh, things which the IBBI has come across. So now it says the IBBI says respect the demarcation of the roles and responsibilities assigned by the code to different stakeholders and shall not either directly or indirectly shall not directly, uh, just a second, I, I lost in one of the messages, uh, shall not directly or indirectly interfere with the functions of the insolvency professional. So they want that the COC should strictly adhere to their mandate. At all times endeavor to ensure that timelines prescribed in the code of and regulations are adhered to, not contravene any provision of the code regulations, instructions and guidelines, Endeavor to protect the CD as a running business and its assets and take necessary steps to protect the value and extend interim finance to the extent required for completion of the process. So uh, they are not only in these regulations, they are not only saying that they pay the cost, but also provide the interim finance. So now I solicit the suggestions from the August gathering on those last few things in this paper on this issue. In fact, it is not necessary to comment on these. In fact, the IBBI says that you can also ask some of more points to be included on those things. So any member want to say anything on those things? Sir, I, you know, IBBI has almost mentioned everything, uh, you know, that we could ask for in terms of uh, insolvency, uh, professional fee, interim finance, timeline, legal compliance, etc. So if, uh, one can think of, you know, one odd thing here and there. So it's not about, uh, you know, what has been missed in the code of conduct. More importantly, how are we going to just, and see, the code of conduct is going to come irrespective. The code of conduct is very comprehensive, take granted. The only question that remains is how does it actually get implemented? And uh, assume that uh, uh, COC uh, has appointed an IP with a threat that if, um, if you don't follow or if you complain or anything, then we are going to throw you out. The IP also has no option. He'll say, yeah, do whatever. I'm also stuck and uh, it's the devil in the dead sea and there is nothing I can do. So I will have no option but to follow. So eventually, I keep repeating that just like uh, the uh, behavioral change uh, that ha that IBC has brought about in the FCs, this behavioral change will come about in the C should come about, and that is the whole objective that COC must begin to behave. What happens if it uh, if it doesn't uh, follow? That's one million dollar question we don't know the answer to. Uh, does the COC have penalties uh, with the IP? And uh, or if IP is found absolutely uh, uh, without any blame, then uh, the penalties actually get share, uh, uh, shifted to COC. Uh, that's one question that we need to ask. Um, other than that, uh, we just need a system where we can, uh, the IBBI can identify as to who's telling the truth, whether the IP is the one at fault and he's blaming, shifting the blame to COC or COC uh, is actually, uh, you know, uh, who's who's at fault and uh, so what if we are able to identify that without going into too much of uh, uh, you know back and forth time based just blaming each other and um, that is what 
needs to be finalized, which should come from uh, the, the forms being filled uh, with that particular checkbox and emails going. And a couple of times things happening, one or two uh, orders against COC, I believe the, the other, you know, the behavioral change would, would come reasonably fast. Yeah, thank, thank you, you Atulji, for your valuable suggestion. In fact, IBC has brought behavioral change in a lot of people. So hopefully this code of conduct will bring behavioral change in the uh, COC's uh, outlook. So with that, we wrap up this part of the discussion paper. And now we go to the next, next issue, which has been dealt by the IBPI in this document is the Swiss challenge. The Swiss challenge is one of most uh, hot subject when pre-PEC insolvency came, but so far there are a few things like the number of the cases in pre-PEC, I don't know how many has been so far decided, but what they want to deal in this particular issue is that request for resolution plan and use of the Swiss challenge. So they go on the, like the Swiss challenge as everybody know that the one person come out with an unsolicited bid to say that this is the bid and this person is given the right of first priority in some sense, like he can match the highest bidder. That is the reward given to that person to coming out with the first of the proposal. That is exactly the Swiss challenge is in, in a very summary form, if we can say. So after they discuss the Swiss challenge and they come out various other things and they propose to uh, ask for comments on the following issues. These are the six, uh, about six issues in fact, only six issues on which IBBI is asking the comment. The first is the RP and COC to place RFRP with due consideration of the market considerations. Second, the COC shall decide on allowing the revision of RFRP number of such revisions and timeline for such on ex ante basis, like even before the process starts. The number of the revisions shall not exceed two. So they are criticizing basically the practice where the 10 things or sometimes multiple times it is getting revised. The COC shall decide the timeline within which it will allow for negotiations and changes to the submitted resolution plans. So every time the extension is given, they are asking suggestions on it. The COC and RP shall not entertain unsolicited revisions to the resolution plan. Uh, that is also something like if the COC doesn't ask, the person cannot revise or something like that. They want to put an estoppel on the powers of the resolution applicant. The COC shall decide whether it considers appropriate to opt for Swiss challenge method. And if the same is decided by the COC, then it should be provided in RFRP on ex ante basis. So what they want to say that the terms of the RSRP cannot be changed, like you cannot do it later on Swiss challenge. So there are instances where the, the best bidder was selected and thereafter the Swiss challenge was done in some of the cases. The COC to decide the basis of the evaluations timelines within which the challenge process shall be concluded and minimum threshold for improvement over the resolution plan on ex ante basis. This is also a feature of the Swiss challenge where they provide the minimum threshold and it is basically taken from the pre-pack insolvency. So now I uh, request all the members to give their suggestions on those six issues. Uh, Manish, if you permit me, I will just like to make a brief comment. Yes, sir. Uh, we haven't yet tested the Swiss challenge system fully as proposed in that uh, pre-pack. Uh, we fancy every new thing to solve all our problems without getting into it. Of course, Supreme Court also allows experimentation with the economic legislation, but these things need to be tested properly. Swiss challenge in prepack has not taken off and now we are talking about it in the CRP and we are talking about it in liquidation. And uh, the definition of Swiss challenge given itself is that unsolicited proposals then why, why should we invite EOI? Why should we have all those proposals? So this one change will lead to so many other changes. So, and see, it has been talked about since decades. I have worked in a number of urban infrastructure projects, but it has not proved its worth so far in uh, large numbers. One or two examples of success um, may not necessarily change the whole system. 
So my view is that it is too early to introduce this switch challenge method everywhere in the uh, processes under IBC. Sir, I would just like to add one thing, if I may, that if, if we are going for switch challenge, then the resolution plan submitted by one RA needs to be he uh, shown to the other ROD that this challenge can uh, take place because there are different parameters of a resolution plan. Though we come out with a total value of a plan, but how is distributing the money, how much upfront amount is being given, everything. There are a lot of things in a plan. It is not like an option where you only have an asset and you have to bid for it. No, but when you are giving a plan which has different views as far as even mergers and acquisitions and shareholding, everything is going to change. So in Swiss, if we go for Swiss challenge, so resolution plans need to be shared with every resolution applicant. This is what my understanding is, if I may be wrong. Thanks, Gautam Ji. Those are two important suggestions. One is there is a transparency and what you do if your plan doesn't meet to the parameter and you still want to give the plan. So with that uh, thing, I invite Mr. Anand Ji to give his suggestions. Thank you. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Uh, I had a slightly different perspective because uh, I feel the issue of Swiss challenge and the other things that is pointed by IBBI, it obviously is an after effect of the or the overhang because of the COC maneuvers that is being done. Uh, any plan acceptance or non-timeline adherence to discussions on uh, resolution plans, multiple revisions of RFRP basically happens from some bit of, if I may add, non-disciplinary approach by COC that we have discussed in the previous section. And I do agree with uh, earlier what was said by Mr. Madhusudan, that uh, Swiss challenge is an untested concept which needs to be tested. Uh, my simple take on this would be Swiss challenge may be untested, but if proper discipline and methodology is followed, it is possible. And as far as disclosure of information, on resolution plan between RAs, there can be a method which can be adopted and it can be shared. But what is most important today is a bit of discipline in the way COC acts. Today, it's very, very arbitrary. COC may decide to look at plans and then say, no, we will discuss next time or we want this changes to come or that changes to become. It's quite arbitrary. The discussion is not, or, or the deliberation on the plan and the way the plans are looked at, except for few cases, is very, very arbitrary. I, I mean, on a lighter side, I can say the wisdom of commercial wisdom is not visible in COC meeting most of the time. That's a limited point that I had to make. Thank you, sir. That's a very important aspect. And I can see in August gathering, Mr. Sunil Panji is there. He is ex CEO of Triple IPI. Uh, Mr. Uh, Sunilji, would you like to share something, some views of yours on this issue? Uh, Hello. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. All right. First of all, thank you very much. Um, I, I really didn't want to come in as a speaker because I have been uh, associated with many of the discussion forums in the past. And maybe part of the responsibility for the present mess in the system is also on my shoulders because we agreed to a lot of things. We had discussions, but we could never come to a conclusion which was in a manner in which uh, it could lead to a final, uh, let's say, finally well-balanced system. I've been thinking about this and I think actually that uh, we have probably inflated the role of the COC beyond what is normally required to be done. See, the COC has not distinguished itself as a credit purveyor. It has not been able to handle its uh, asset 
in a manner in which you know it was a safe asset it is one of the contributors to the present state where a healthy asset or a what should have been a healthy asset has today become a stressed asset therefore to be giving them you know the benefit of superior commercial judgment and the capability for that i think you know is is slightly unacceptable they should come in as people who are an interested party yes so that the process that is taken up is a a fair process but they should not come in as the arbiters of fate in this particular case that should be left to another body which is a disinterested party which has not been associated with the creation of that npa and this party could be either the aa with an extended uh, structure or it could be some other entity which we can think about but which is not the coc the coc should be one of the parties it should be an equal but it should not be a pri- primary amongst the equals so it is not a you know primus inter pares kind of a thing but it should it should be an equal system and there it should also be subject to norms conditions and conditionalities that would apply to any participant in the process and the role of the resolution pro- uh, professional should be that of an expert advisor to this particular body which sits in trying to work out a situation where there is some kind of a resolution the coc normally would be interested in a recovery because that is faster and they are able to chalk up a certain level of uh, performance and they are able to show it to the management saying that we have recovered so much from this asset and the asset is closed or whatever it is so the general focus of a creditor would be in terms of recovery whereas the general focus of ibc is not recovery but resolution and therefore there is again a conflict that arises out there therefore giving a uh, coc the superior position when their logic or their capability is not unimpeachable is something that needs to be considered and that is basically what i have been thinking the last couple of days since i received this invitation that that is one thing i would like to have considered as regards the swiss challenge as very rightly said by mr madhusudan sharma it is something that is not really worked it's it's a great thing on paper but in practical uh, application i don't know very many cases where swiss challenge has really thrown up some kind of startlingly startlingly good results so i think you know it could be something that would be considered on a case to case basis but it need not be something that is uh, strongly recommended in any forum or by any any body it's one of the ways of resolution and that is what it should remain and i think as regards the other aspects there has been a good discussion that has happened and uh, i think i have benefited from listening to all the participants out here so i think i'll stop here and thank you very much for this opportunity thank you thank you sunil ji this is very valuable suggestion separation of the power and how it is to be dealt now i again invite mr atul ji who want to say something on the issue um yeah uh, so far as uh, um, uh, sunil pant ji has said ke coc uh, you know need not be considered such a such a such a big deal but uh, irrespective of how we see coc ends up controlling the ip Uh, because they are the ones who are uh, who have the ip under their control so even if we say ip is uh, uh, you know more of a uh, uh, expert but in respect if he is he continues to be subservient to the coc unless we dismantle the 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 banks impanelment process where uh, you know and loosen the control the banks have over ips uh, so that's just one thought uh, in continuation with the with the point so far as the swiss challenge is concerned uh, i think it's it is it's it's time we experimented with it uh, because uh, what are our options anyway uh, if we don't have swiss challenge then we have what we have uh, which is uh, which is which is in front of us so what does what is really swiss challenge do it says that uh, the person who who takes the initiative gets the right to, uh, to refuse uh, in ppirp case it is going to be the msme corporate debtor so uh, they will have a right uh, to um, control or uh, own continue to own the assets uh, as long as uh, so they have the right to refuse it so in cirp uh, if we have uh, an unsolicited uh, uh, plan 
it's it's worth giving a try because the moment everybody anybody who's interested would want to have it's it's a it's a huge power to have a right to refusal because what am i trying to do i'm trying to uh, buy an asset at the lowest price possible and and i know that i have that scope i have that additional you know that uh, extra 100 rupees in my pocket but i am keeping it to myself in the hope in the in the hope to see you know if i can if i can save that money so uh, right to refusal in cirp uh, might see uh, a few uh, ras come up uh, in order to uh, have this extra card in their hand uh, so so that's one other than that, uh, you know, Swiss challenge would also typically means a multivariate auction. So what, what's happening nowadays, the way I'm, whatever I have seen so far is that everything boils down to uh, ultimately to one price. Ke aap kitna dete ho. And everything else takes a back seat up front, back, uh, you know, later on, etc. It sort of, it, it starts off in that direction, but eventually it boils down to uh, who, who is paying the highest. Uh, so uh, that is something we need to uh, innovate upon and make sure that the auction actually takes place uh, on on a multivariate basis and the um, the evaluation matrix is is offered and uh, changes to certain figures does make a change to an overall net score and uh, so that 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 system has yet to develop uh, which uh, is uh, also part of swiss challenge and uh, of course, resolution plans need to uh, be created eventually in some way where some kind of comparison is possible, where we say, all right, there is enough creativity, there is enough, uh, you know, uh, plans coming up. But at the end of the day, we are actually, uh, the COC is, 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 is capable of making uh, an informed decision based on evaluation matrix. And uh, so plan comparison could eventually result in some kind of an automated uh, you know, we can have a system where uh, plans can be compared automatically as well, but then they have to be standardized to some extent. So net-net uh, Swiss challenge is something that uh, we should give it a shot even in CIRP. Of course, it's there in PPRP anyway. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Atulji. I think the creativity should be promoted is the key uh, key message from Atulji. Uh, Mr. Shivanandanji wants to give his suggestions. Point number one is that COC members who hold more than 51% or 50% try to bully the whole process and, you know, and also try to hold the RP by juggler many times. So this reporting that what has happened and what is not happening and then uh, maybe there is a need that all the COC members must vote if RP have to be changed and the yardstick of 51% needs to be replaced with a larger percentage so that RP's independence is still kept in control. And RP before getting out of the system should have an exit interview with adjudicating authority or somebody of the circumstances and situations which have led to his removal proposal. Point two, I second the view of Mr. Gautam Singhal with regard to that, how will we have, because it is a healthy exercise if you have a Swiss challenge and also say that COC always wants more. So if the person who comes as a Swiss challenger gives a 5% or 10% extra than the highest bidder. But my question is that how do we give a transparent figure of the H1 and it's, we can drive its NPV and get into it, but what happens if there are more than two or three bidders who say that we all offer a Swiss challenge? How do you deal with it? That's a, that's a valid question which has been posed by Mr. Shiv Kumar. Now a quick announcement, the membership link has been given in the chat box. And with that, I come to the last issue dealt in this paper is regarding the uh, BG. So what they want to do is they want to create a distinct kind of category within the COC regarding the BG. So they have, been, they have given three scenarios. I think the screen is visible. The first scenario is where the 
BG was invoked by the beneficiary before the commencement of the CIRP. The second scenario where the BG remains live and remains uninvoked. So there is no dispute in both these scenarios. So the critical scenario is the third one where the BG is invoked by the beneficiary during the CIRP. So what they wish to do is the proposed amendment says it is proposed to provide in regulations that in case the BG is invoked by the beneficiary during the CIRP, the issuer shall be eligible to submit its claim to the resolution professional. So prima facie, the suggestions has to be given whether this could be permitted because there is a timeline within which the claim has to be a reason, like before the date. And they are saying that even after the date, this particular type of creditor can file the claim. So what are the suggestions by the uh, members can give the suggestions whether this should be done and how far you will create categories on categories for this kind of claims. Yeah, uh, in, in, with regard to the invocation of the bank guarantees, uh, bank guarantee is a pre-decided liability if it, in, it is invoked. So uh, whether it is invoked prior, prior to it, the, the, uh, the BG provider is a creditor in future if it is, it is invoked in subsequently. So the, the uh, provision of their liability being admitted at any stage should be the part of the proposal, even in the resolution plan, how the resolution applicant wants to deal with uninvoked bank guarantees should be given because the, in the information memorandum, there should be clear information which are the bank guarantees which is yet to be invoked so that the uh, because it is it is it is going to be invoked subsequently the validity is there so one cannot deny the uh, right of the banker who is who has paid the money whether uh, even if afterwards so there must be some provision if it was only a confusion earlier whether whether it this should be given they will given the right of claim or not if the if if it was not there, it should have been there, and the provision and it must be about uh, allowed them to file the claim. That is my view. Thank you, Rajkumar ji, for your news. Now, with this, we conclude this particular discussion paper and come to the next one, where there is an atmosphere of the lack of trust with the role of the resolution professional, and they want accountability on the part of the resolution professional at the time of the liquidation. So this paper starts with the very noble idea strengthening the regulatory framework in the liquidation process. Uh, sorry to interrupt, uh, Manish, it's just an announcement for the participants. Uh, the timing was till 6.05. So since one very important topic is still left, so I'm requesting, uh, and I hope all participants also agree, to extend this to 6.30. Uh, I think I think we I think we should uh, extend and uh, we should continue up to six thirty. This is my with, with the silence. I was thank thinking you, thank it, you. It, should be deemed, it should be deemed acceptance. <laughs> but be there. So it is good because our program was time bound. So we need to make an application for extension. That I have done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's the true spirit of the democracy. So the next discussion paper is on the uh, regulatory framework on the liquidation process and basically what the IBBI has highlighted in this paper that accountability mechanism must be robust and it leads ineffective participation and dissatisfaction among the stakeholders. So what they are saying that the stakeholders are not very satisfied the way the liquidator is performing their duties. And therefore they have come out with uh, suggestions which expand the scope of the stakeholders committee. So the counterpart of the COC. On one hand, they are saying that the COC should be restricted on the other hand, they are saying that their power should be extended. So they, they are very much conscious of the fact that the liquidator can overwrite the decision of the COC, but still they want to give some powers to them. So the first is expanding the scope. Thereafter, they go on to discuss the provisions and then they give the examples of the Companies Act, the earlier one, the new one, the international practices, but this is something very important because what they are trying to give the control of the 
liquidator who is an independent quasi judicial authority in hands of those people against whom he is supposed to act if they have done something wrong so whether there is a conflict of interest or not that is an important thing and the the suggestions uh, are the like what they have seen just this, uh, i'll come to directly because we have limited time so so i'll <clears throat> so the proposed amendments are so the proposed amendments are that there is a schedule and uh, it is in para 20 sir uh, yes sir it, it's on multiple para thank you sir actually i i missed my uh, para 20 so i'll come to paragraph 20 so the first suggestion is in para 20 it is proposed to provide in the liquidation regulation that the liquidator shall consult scc on all significant matters relating to the liquidation process including appointment of professionals and sale of the assets and fixation of the reserve price in excess trust so uh, the suggestions is invited from the uh, manish if you permit me yes, i'll sir. make a small comment on the last issue regarding the bank guarantee yes sir uh, uh, the issue regarding encashment of bank guarantee during the crp process period i'll restrict only to that part now the claim has to be as on insolvency commencement date and if any event takes place after the insolvency commencement date can it be considered a claim and second thing is any cost during the crp gets priority one under the section 53 that is the crp uh, the fee and expenses of rp plus all the crp period expenses so my view is that it is covered in that uh, cr i insolvency resolution process cost and uh, payments which are due during the crp period has to be paid as priority number 1 there is no need of filing a claim for that thank you very much sir Uh, now i invite mr devang sampath ji for his suggestions devang ji please go ahead sir a small point first first uh, the present which uh, role of uh, stakeholder consultation committee which is advisory was introduced on a cp insol paper and the majority of the members in the committee were bankers so the beginning of this particular process has been where uh, maybe there was hardly any consultation with any ip and this advisory role has come in uh, maybe whatever we have said said for stakeholders consultation for coc the same also has to be brought in for stakeholders consultation committee but all they have to be given a decision making power second thing is when professionals etc are also appointed by uh, uh, maybe the uh, stakeholders consultation committee this could again be a tool of backhand uh, controlling the process including the reserve price maybe that is one uh, uh, concern which i have maybe it may not be true in all cases but certainly in some cases thank you very much devang ji this is very, uh, this is definitely a concern and that's perhaps the thinking behind it that it should not be sold at unreasonably long uh, low price uh, i invite mr ganesh ramani ji to give his comments see uh, hi as regards this appointment of professionals in the liquidation process most of the thing happens because stakeholders committee is formed after 60 days or within 60 days after you receive the claim plot and all that whereas you are your appointment of professionals of valuers and everything because your attempt to do the valuation is at the earliest even if you're going concerned is within 90 days or thereafter also so i don't know how when they say that they have to consult stakeholders committee that means first 60 days are you not supposed to appoint anyone um it's only probably only those professionals who are a requirement after 60 days i don't know how many professor at that time will be required except for the sale process i don't know the intent therefore the, behind the question there uh, thank you ganesh ji uh, one of the concern pointed out by the ibbi is that in some of the cases what they have found is that uh, the rp or the liquidator has appointed agents on commission basis so they were basically concerned about the the entire process and the delegation of the power so with that i come to the next issue which next suggestion which ibbi is uh, 
coming with so the next suggestion of the ibbi is it is proposed it's paragraph 27 of the discussion paper it is proposed to provide in the liquidation regulations that the liquidator may facilitate the stakeholders of each class to nominate their representatives while adhering to the voting principles of the majority of the value of the claims of those present and voting for inclusion in the consultation committee so there were two issues like whether it should be one person one vote or it should be the value so they are going with the value and they are saying that the present and voting concept should be there so uh, with that i invite the suggestion whether this is a right thing to do or not whether it should be there it should not be there any suggestions from the august gathering i think that people got exhausted in in case of liquidation it should always be presented voting only this is my feeling because because in the liquidation what happens many of the creditors lose their interest in the participation because the value they are going to derive is rarely anything so they are not participating at all so uh, if, if if the if the voting percentage is based on the overall value it it is going to lose the importance of the process so it's always that it's it is on the present and voting only that is that is my limited view on that thank you rajkumar ji i see some of the members are putting their suggestions in the chat box uh, we will incorporate all those suggestions also on our note but i request them to uh, say it orally so other people can also take benefit of their views with that i invite mr atul ji again to give his views i i agree with the raj kamal ji uh, liquidation is almost the last process we are almost going to sell everything and wind uh, uh, you know the, the data uh, so there's no point uh, you know waiting and uh, uh, those who are not participating we can very safely assume are not interested because they are very well aware of what's happening so uh, to take quicker uh, you know uh, uh, decisions present and voting and uh, uh, definitely be incorporated and we should uh, go ahead so same thing what raj kamal ji said thank you very much sir the next suggestions given by the ibbi for the proposed amendments are what they are saying that it is proposed to provide schedule 1 of the liquidation regulation that for participation in the auction the liquidator shall not require payment of any fee or non refundable deposit from the potential bidders and secondly prescribed emd in excess of the 10% so that's what is that is what they are deriving from the regulations regarding the cirp as well and I, I ask the people to give comments on this. हाँ नहीं इसमें भी same है ना मतलब why why create barriers uh, for uh, resolving or liquidating by saying ten percent uh, EMD and by creating these barriers we must lower all these barriers and get the process flowing the water must flow so uh, I would agree with this. thank thank you atul ji uh, devan ji want to say something yeah some some minimum minimum emd must be there to have the genuineness of the part, uh, participant otherwise there should not be any charge on the participants emd means that you are sincere in participating that is if it is he is not successful then that is it different that is the limited point thank you rajkumar ji devang ji want to say something i think uh, anyway so the next suggestion is uh, regarding the amendments is again uh, let me share the screen first so the next suggestion is that it is proposed to insert a clarification in the schedule which explicitly provides that liquidator shall provide reasons for rejection of the highest bid so what the suggestion flows from the examples where the ibbi has observed that even the highest bid in liquidation was not accepted and what the ibbi has found that invariably there was a clause in which the liquidator retained the power like in a government tender document to reject the highest bid so what they want that the liquidator should give reasons and put it before the coc 
So this is the next amendment proposed or the next thing proposed by the IBBA. So this seems to be a fair suggestion, but if there is any contrary view, they are most welcome. Any suggestions on this issue? In, in this matter, I would like to make a, a smaller point. As far as the rejection of the first meter is concerned, it's a very rare thing. And if it is, it is there, then there must be some justification. And the decision of rejecting the uh, for the highest bidder should rest with the adjudicating authority, not the resolution professional. Why he wants to reject and why he wants to award that uh, asset to the somebody else, uh, or the whether second bidder or anybody else. So that should be rest with the uh, adjudicating authority. That will give the transparency. Thank you, Raj Kamalji. I have uh, there are a lot of members who are giving suggestions uh, like Beams and Goelji. Vimshanji, would you like to say something on any of the issues which I have covered so far? Master. So we next we move on to the other issues. Then again, the, the again in the liquidation process, the suggestions are invited by the IBBI in the Swiss challenge. So perhaps the Swiss word is very appealing to the Indian masses. So everywhere the Swiss challenge pops up. So what they want to say, whether there could be a Swiss challenge. So they want the legal position in the court. They are aware that they have already given validity to it. But at the same time, they are not sure whether they can recommend it or not. So what they want to give the suggestions that whether the Swiss challenge could be incorporated or not. And there is an economic analysis given for this. And they wanted to say that we can't recommend any one process. So the, the discussion is almost inconclusive. And after that discussion, they move to the security interested relation issue. In security related, they have found that, that where charge has been created by multiple lenders on one asset, when the highest, uh, the person who has given highest loan relinquishes his charge, but the other couple doesn't want to give the security. So what should be the mechanism? So they have relied upon the various judicial pronouncement and relied upon the Surfacy Act and they came out with a figure to say 60%, whether when there is a 60% 60 60 of the, the stakeholder has given the relinquishment, then it should be binding on the others as well. So the, the relevant paragraph is 67, where it says it is proposed to provide in liquidation regulation, if the secured creditor having 60% of the value in the secured debt decided to relinquish or realize the security interest, such decision shall be binding on others para pasu charge holders. So this is what they wish to do. So any views or comments on this particular thing, whether it should be binding even for the people, the majority should prevail or not. This is a welcome welcome proposal to uh, can, uh, remove the confusions. It's very necessary. Otherwise, it is a, it is a matter of contentious uh, uh, confusions. Sir, it's a minority interest. Kaha wo fir address hoga. Agar to koi chote mote jisne financial apna amount de rakha hoga CD ko, wo to bichara bhar jayega. Ki bhai sab mere security interest bhi hai, paru paisu wo wo bhi hai aur wo mere mere ko jaye binding kar rahe ho. Sir, sir, security interest is major agreement by Jayaga. All security interest will not go. This is my, my, my thinking. Suppose there is a consortium banking and the consortium banking, the one of the one of consortium banking, the 60% decided to relinquish the charges, that should prevail. Suppose I'm a, I'm a car financer, I don't want to relinquish, I want to take over the car. So I, I must have the liberty of doing that. It cannot be a basket for all, all the security provider. That is my 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 my. Yeah. That cannot be for the entire. That is, that is my view. Thank you, thank you very much, sir. Yogesh, they are actually not down. relinquishing. They are not losing their interest. They are still at par with the other financial creditors, and they will get what the other financial creditors will be getting. So whether they concede relinquishment or they don't concede, it does not matter. Thank you very much, Yogeshji. And it was nice of you to put a comment as well as to say it orally. So with that, we come to almost at the end of this discussion paper in which they have come, they have asked suggestion on all the points at the bottom of this thing. So I'll share the last time the thing, uh, which is Manishi, Manishi, can I, can I uh, make a one point? 
Yes, sir. Uh, regarding the agency commission, in case of NRRA, which is not readily sellable assets, in that case, the disposing the assets, some agency needs to be involved. For those type of assets, I think some commission portion must be there. Otherwise, it is very difficult to, to uh, implement that part also. This is my view. Uh, but uh, definitely for other matters, there should not be any commission. There should be a direct sale. That, 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 that I agree. That's a very valid point, Raj Kamalji. So far, the, the, the Indian market is ma not mature enough for actionable claim or chose as they say in England. So what has happened in many developed jurisdictions, there is a developed market where the people buy these claims on contingency basis. But so far, because of the legal uncertainty, the people are not com coming forward to buy these assets. So with that, I, 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 I invite the suggestions on these all these issues, which has been covered in paragraph 69 of the discussion paper. It says, should the consultation with the SAC be mandated for all significant mandators related to the liquidation process? We have already discussed this one. Is there any need to specify criterion for nomination of the representative? We have also covered this. Should the engagement of the professional, this is important, should the engagement of the profession, sales agent, commission, success fee basis be prohibited? So they are not sure. Should SCC be consulted for preparing and marketing strategy of sale of the assets? Then they want to know, should the prohibition on payment of the fee or non-refundable deposit for participation in the auction during the liquidation process be explicitly provided under the liquidation regulations? Should maximum threshold of EMD for participation in auction be fixed? Should the liquidation provide the reasons for rejection of the highest bid? Is there any need to specify specific method of auction? And should the decision of the secured creditor holding 60% of the value? So basically, they have summarized everything which has been compiled in the above discussion paper. And so I solicit if any of the member of this meeting want to say anything on any of those issues, the, the floor is open. Manish, uh, is that uh, slide one? Yes, Madhusudan. Please see that uh, displayed, the questions, so that it is convenient for the people to comment on that. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll reshare the, the document. Uh, yes, sir. Is it visible, sir? It is visible. So if anyone is not giving comment, I, I can uh, do that. Now there are multiple people. Hello. Yes, sir, please go ahead. OK. First of all, uh, the EMD amount of percentage. And second thing, non-refundable uh, EMD compulsory should be done away with. Because a number of times it has been seen that people only to extend time and to reduce value put EMD and then don't bid. So the reason uh, maybe uh, everyone doing liquidation is aware that there are buyers who want five to seven liquidation auctions to fail so that they get at a very good price. There are some specific buyers in the market who are tuned to this particular type of buying. In surface, also non-refundable uh, EMD is uh, being done. So percentage of EMD and uh, refundable or non-refundable should be left to the discretion of uh, maybe liquidator or whichever body it is on case-to-case -case basis. Uh, too much of regulation also may be harmful. So that is my humble submission on this particular point. Thank you very much, sir. It's an important suggestion. Now I invite Mr. Atulji to give his suggestions. Uh, the ultimately the issue gets stuck when it comes to getting hold of resolution applicants and actually selling the asset. So my personal take is that Swiss challenge, be it in PPRP, CIRP liquidation, is going to be a welcome step because the way I see it is that immediately it gives you a trump card. It gives you that extra joker in your hand, which you can always play with. So if I am interested, if I, if, I, if I have my eyes set on some asset or some company, I would not want to let that company go. So even if I put in a lower bid, 
but i would want that extra joker with me so that i can always you know raise it as the market evolves and i definitely would like to you know uh, because at the end of the day uh, as a rational person i want to buy, uh, buy the asset at the lowest possible price at the same time i don't want to lose out on that uh, right of uh, uh, refusal so swiss challenge is one uh, which is going to be a great idea in in any situation then comes the sale commission so uh, uh, so the, the the law presently gives a percentage in the in case of liquidation uh, but uh, see uh, ips are not uh, you know we need specialized sale agents we need specialized marketeers whose only job is to do this and uh, uh, typically to expect an ip to share that percentage of liquidation uh, this thing with with somebody it, you know there's always a question mark and by the time you take a call the time's already up so uh, some kind of sale commission has to be kept separate for the uh, companies or uh, people who are specifically uh, sale agents or you know marketing uh, companies naturally emds should be kept uh, low so that uh, again i said lower the barriers of course there is a there's a problem if i lower the barrier then i can uh, you know i'll i'll try to uh, uh, have uh, or participate in multiple options uh, auction at the same time but that i'm doing it at my own risk um, i will have to let go one or the other but uh, point being that um, auction barriers uh, where i am threatened with uh, uh, you know my uh, guarantee being uh, uh, taken uh, in case i you know don't participate or something uh it's a it's a of course it's a balancing act we have to keep it but at the same time we need to lower it so um uh yeah primarily the focus has to be on selling and making sure that uh, we somehow manage to arouse interest uh, and have more resolution applicants participate so i think swiss challenge sale commission low emd all of these are very welcome uh, steps Thank, Thank you. you very much, sir. Now I invite the other uh, Mr. Shiv Kumar ji to give his suggestions. You see, Swiss challenge is a very good idea, but suppose I am giving a bid, which is a well-priced bid, and somebody else has just put in a Swiss challenge clause. Why should I lose this opportunity? So when a Swiss challenge is given, a clause must be added that then there will be an inter-sea bidding. suppose my bid is 100 crores and the other person has bid 50 crores and he said i take a swiss challenge then we must have an inter sea bidding to add to the value it should just not be allowed as that somebody says i give a swiss challenge and i will take it away my bid is the best and i still have an option to improve it i think this is a very important feature because Uh, you have seen it in the video con matter four percent five percent realizations, and if somebody added a Swiss challenge here, then what would have happened? So I I believe that value accretion is the right of all the creditors, and it must happen. As regards EMD, you see, we must allow the interested people who are genuinely interested. So there must be some earnest money deposit with regard to. a person to enter the bidding room even uh, in many of the tenders and all without giving a earnest money deposit you are not allowed to participate in a tender so i think emd is one essential which will only have the interested bidder around thank you thank you very much sir any other member wish to give any suggestions i am a little confused here uh, about the swiss challenge जो वेन शेव नंदन जी सेज दैट आई पुट इन माई बेड एंड समबडी पुट्स इन अ स्विस चैलेंज आई डेंट गेट दैट पॉइंट अकॉर्डिंग टू मी मे बी माई अंडरस्टैंडिंग स्विस चैलेंज इज स्लाइटली डिफरेंट देर इज देर इज नॉट दैट समबडी सेज हंड्रेड रुपीज एंड समबडी एल्स कम्स एंड सेज आई वॉन्ट टू स्विस चैलेंज इट और दे थ्री पीपल ट्राइंग टू स्विस चैलेंज इच अदर आई मीन माई अंडरस्टैंडिंग इज दैट दी आर एफ आर पी सेज दैट दिस इज गोइंग टू गो अंडर स्विस चैलेंज विच मीन्स anybody who puts in first also gets the right of first refusal 
And that is the reason why we invite more people to quickly put in their bid and get hold of that extra trump card. Everybody else has have to participate. They, the interest bidding, et cetera, that will always take place. But I will continue to be given that right that in the end, uh, if the last uh, bid is uh, a thousand rupees, then I can always outbid it because I was the one who started it first. And uh, naturally, it, it cannot be that I start at one rupee and it goes to thousand rupees. It has to be no more than you know five, ten percent, etc. But uh, my understanding of Swiss challenge is that RFRP may ek bar apne likh diya Swiss challenge. So now we are waiting for the one who has put his bid in front of him, and he has a right of first refusal to put his bid in front of him. Now the rest of the others will bid, and outbid him. If he will bid more than 10%, then he will go to right of refusal because they, the, somebody came and uh, you know, put in uh, 25 or 50% extra. So uh, I am a little, uh, I am trying to figure out if my understanding of Swiss challenge is right. I, I, I think there is a different of difference of perspective. So what I have understood from Mr. Shiv is he was trying to uh, imagine a scenario where the person who is doing Swiss challenge is coming out of the qualification. He doesn't meet the qualification, but he wants to outbid all those people who meet the qualification, come out with something new. So there are multiple ways a Swiss challenge can be built in different scenarios. So experimentation is one thing and maybe everybody has a different perspective and that's why they can module the entire Swiss challenge in different ways. With that note, like we are coming closer to our second deadline. So any more final quick comments? I think. Sir, uh, it's not, uh, under regulation 33, one of uh, liquidation regulations, there is already a process of e-auction. Now in Swiss challenge, what happens is uh, sometimes a person doesn't come up with a base proposal. proposal. He keeps a base proposal for the end. So under a CIRP, it is a totally different matter. Under liquidation, when it is going under hammer, under uh, e-option, keeping a Swiss challenge may lead to a situation when the best offer is not coming. And uh, again, it's, um, uh, it's a process which needs to be thought about by many seniors. Uh, but that is, that is one limitation because this is a transparent process, e-option process. So whether a Swiss auction would be harmful or uh, uh, maybe advisable in this particular circumstances of uh, liquidation is something which we need to ponder. The so, Wangji, my understanding is that the e-auction continues the way it is. Okay, if you actually want to look at a difference between the Swiss challenge e-auction, they're both the same processes with just one minor difference that the Swiss challenge uh, may, the, the, the guy who puts in the first bid or unsolicited bid, gets the right to first refusal. Other than that, everything remains the same. And supposing the person who puts in this, uh, you know, his, his bid turns out to be non, not eligible, for example, then it is assumed that he didn't participate. The next guy who came in, the, the second guy came, will get that right of first refusal. Somebody will be given the right of first refusal in order to get the excitement going and people uh, wanting to participate. Everything else remains the same. It's the e-auction only. Between Swiss Challenge e-auction, there's only one minor difference of the right of refusal. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you all for the wonderful participation and uh, views which are exchanged. With this, now I invite Mr. Alokji to give a vote of thanks. Alokji, yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you, Vanishji. Thank you for uh, conducting this uh, wonderful session. And thanks to all the participants who have been uh, there listening patiently and also participating with uh, such nice comments. Uh, so the two uh, discussion papers have been discussed uh, uh, in this session today. Uh, the first was the CIRP part and the second was the liquidation. The CIRP part, uh, uh, majority uh, time was spent on the COC portion wherein it was discussed whether how practicable uh, it would be and how would uh, IBBI uh, in seeking these views and suggesting uh, these steps would be implementing that. More so in the case of it, uh, even the judgments of the uh, uh, export, uh, which talks about the commercial wisdom of the COC. Uh, members also talked about the similar accountability uh, as the IPs are facing penalties to be uh, imposed and the provisions be made. And then uh, uh, the COC members, when they are enjoying the uh, supreme decision-making parts, how accountable they are to the complete process. So that needs to be seen. 
And uh, again, as I said, uh, the members expressed their views in terms of the challenge which uh, IBBI would be facing. Uh, in the same tone, Swiss challenge was discussed, how uh, relevant it is and how uh, uh, what benefits it could bring into the process. And then uh, uh, the litigation part, which we discussed the litigation process, uh, the constitution of the SCC. Again, uh, the practicability part and the utility part uh, were the highlights of uh, today's session, how these would be implemented and what benefits it would bring in. Then the EMB, uh, this money deposit, whether it should be there, should not be there, or there should be a bar, I mean, some percentage uh, fixation on that. And uh, the participation piece. The idea was to have more and more participation, to have more and more I mean, people participating in the best value uh, for businesses. So that was the gist of today's uh, uh, participation in the program. And I once again thank all the participants. So all these views would be uh, collated and presented to uh, ADBI as they have uh, stored views from the public. Uh, in addition, I would request, as Manish, Manish Ji also uh, suggested in the beginning, uh, members are requested to send us emails if they have additional views. So they are most welcome. Uh, we'll be taking another uh, three, four days' time to collate and then send. So we have uh, still some time. So we welcome all, all views. So with this, I, I uh, announce this uh, program as closed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vincent. Look forward to meet you again in the next program. Thank you.